Our first panel on Wednesday, Lure of the, Re of the Retro Lens, discussed the concept of the archive as this kind of insurance against the loss of memory. In particular, Gregory Charlet showed interventionist strategies of how to make this hindsight or memories present through visual gestures in the public space, for example. There are different and complex layers in the hiding, forgetting, and visualization or reappearance of memory from the social, collective, and urban level of Gregory's examples, for those of you who were here last Wednesday, to the puzzling depth of an individual's ego, melancholia, and protective boundaries of identity. The tension between sharing and withholding, to trust over or to maintain a grasp, not only attests to the archive's mystery, but takes it to a quasi-mystical domain. Given that we're celebrating the centennial of avant-garde uh, poet and community activist Clemente Soto Vélez, a man that reconciled diaspora with rootedness, artistic genius without social isolation, I have a personal anecdote that may highlight the complexity of this push-pull equation on how to make hindsight or memory visible and to what extent the act of conserving something plays with the notions of the visual. To show or not to show. To show up or not to show up. Thanks for showing up, by the way. Um, when I was 18, in 1993, the fact of Clemente's death hardly made any news in Puerto Rico. My parents who are here and I were walking by El Ateneo in Viejo San Juan, and I can still remember our shock to confront that that Sunday afternoon, the, the Vigilia on that Sunday afternoon, to this man was literally empty. The site was Spartan, a tombstone, Clemente inside with his long punk punkish hairdo till the end, and a marble desolate plaza. Even though to this day, even though in his day, today social activism was mostly rooted in New York, for some reason at the time of his, de of his death, Clemente decided to make himself visible in Puerto Rico, an island where there were no eyes to see him. He showed up in Puerto Rico and barely a soul showed up for him in his funeral. It is like he openly opted to make himself invisible to New York, where his communities had always been more than ready to receive him, for it is here in New York City that, after all, a center carrying his name exists, like this one. He archived his name in New York City while making himself visible in the island. But again, visibility and archives both need eyes to exist, to be relevant. And there's where the audience comes in. In Puerto Rico, the way where his body was present was a void. In New York City, the archival memory is literally and allegorically full. The Center for Puerto Rican Studies holds his collection of papers, and the CSB Center is vibrant with an output very much in tune with his aesthetic and community ethics. I guess, by the way, that the FBI also has a hefty archive about the man, and maybe that's another <laughs> panel to, uh, on archiving, something we should push to make visible as well. So today's panel is about the pictures, different ways of giving form, of putting memory forth by bridging the abstract concept of the archive with art as a tangible perception. Yet the main task always falls on the audience's responsibility to actively see and integrate the lived experience, taste, loyalties, etc., into what an art scene, a social movement, and an everyday neighborhood is. Thanks. Buenas noches. Uh, <clears throat> Our panelists for the evening are Luisa Ponte Pares. You know, an amazing warrior from back in uh, the real race society uptown days, right? Um, Alan, Alan Moore, uh, my colleague for like 20 years, uh, PhD in art history at Community Grad Center, uh, and um, we were together in the East Village I, co-founder of ABC No Rio, Ed Morales, another old, old colleague. And uh, actually, Clayton's going to be on the next panel, but he's decided to take uh, lots of pictures of the audience. So. <laughs> he's doing the performative part of the panel. <laughs> OK. Filmmaker and journalist, Morales. Bueno, I don't get it. Can you turn the lights on? 
uh, I, when uh, Jasmine asked me to be part of this uh, panel, uh, I guess she thought that I was going to talk about casitas. Uh, and I decided not to talk about casitas. <laughs> and part of the reason is that when I published that article, which is actually three different versions, uh, my argument was that the value of casita was the symbolism or at least the testimony of the way Puerto Ricans have been literally, literally displaced throughout their existence in New York City. It was another romantic. I, mean, I felt that, uh, that casitas represented how bad things were because we had to revert to images of the Caribbean because we couldn't implant, embed the built environment with our own images. So it is really to, to the degree that casitas represent the, the ultimate displacement that we had to travel back in history is a sign that something was very problematic. And so when I saw the whole series of events, I, I said, uh, I'm old enough to remember something that happened in 1975. So my presentation finishes in 1975. Uh, most of the literature and information about Lois that talks about Bimbo Rivas Born. That poem was published and nothing happened. What really happened after the poem was published was this couple of events that took place in 75 and on. And during those events, particularly a, a Thanksgiving dinner given by an old uh, white activist in the Lower East Side, Faith Wright, on a Thanksgiving dinner, we she invited artists and housing activists to talk. I was at that time employed part-time, because I was uh, crazy, uh, with a group called Seven Lows. And we had received, I was employed as a consultant, monies relating to 1976. But what we did, we decided at least to begin to support the interaction between artists and housing. Okay? And just to give you the end before I start, uh, our first funded project was the burial of Lower East Side and the birth of Lower East Side. I don't know if anybody took photographs, I'm sure that somebody, somewhere, has a record of that event, because it, we needed to bury one to, to start the other. So my talk is very simple because I thought that many people are so young and so recent that they may not know that we've been around for a while, we're not yesterday's people. Uh, <coughs> In fact, like I said, when I teach my Latino Studies introductory course, and I said, we were here before the Mayflower. Just remember that. And so one of the, and so this may seem to those of you who know Puerto Rican history, like Puerto Rican History 101. Having said that, I'm trying to also do the parallel story of the built environment, which is usually not in anybody's mirror when they wrote, read, write about Puerto Rican history. One of the reasons I'm working on this arena, which is one of my main projects, was that, uh, I don't know, uh, five, six years ago, Ken Burns, this wonderful artist who has been so-called recording history, seems to have a blind eye. When I watch his New York series, Puerto Ricans appear for the first time in 1998 as a byproduct of Dominicans. <laughs> So I said, my God, he's wrong for 100 years, at least. <laughs> you know, and then everything, everything he touches seems to have this blind spot towards Latinos. And again, so one of the reasons is that one of the problems with the built environment that, as we all know, the built environment is the frozen memory of the power structure. Whoever was in power makes sure that their architects build something that looks like them. So if you go to the pyramids or go to Wall Street, we know that. So what do you do when you're not in that group? So next slide. So what I'm trying to sort of set up is that uh, based on just simple knowledge of Puerto Rican history, we could argue that in fact, and we know for a fact that we were here at the beginning of the industrial city. We were not only here, we were building things that so we were part of the story. We were also here doing the different, so what I'm trying to suggest is that we did not, again, we did not arrive yesterday. We, in fact, we've been building this city except our history doesn't seem to be recorded. Next. And so, 
very quickly, <clears throat> we were not in that sense much more different <clears throat> from other immigrant groups. And in fact, we show up in the city when the Italians and the Poles and the Irish also show up. We're not, but except in that usual story, our name doesn't show up unless you go to Center for Puerto Rican Studies and you learn about our merchants and all kinds of things. Next. And so what you have is that, <clears throat> what we have is that we were, just have to remember one of the important reasons that New York is linked to Puerto Rico is the way U.S. history, which is also missing a lot of their own history, was linked to the Caribbean. Very key here is to realize that when the 13 colonies were around, uh, there was a big role between the port cities, Boston, New York, you name it, Baltimore. Those major port cities were key in bringing in Caribbean products, azúcar, tobacco, <coughs> and café. You know? In fact, it was so important that rum, which is a Jamaican invention, uh, Brooklyn had wonderful molasses and they had, you know, sugar, all the things that were coming from the Caribbean. What did you guys give us? Codfish and slaves. Isn't that nice? The two things that we always needed in our lives. Codfish. So what we're looking at, so we actually come in very early and as early as the 1890s when Puerto Rico and Cuba were the only leftover colonies from Spain, we had a wonderful bunch of immigrants, mostly political exiles and our merchants and their children, uh, which were here planning the revolution down there. And in fact, the Puerto Rican flag was done in New York City in 1895. So that's how far we go. Our, even our flag was not drawn up in Puerto Rico, but in New York City. So our history, history of Puerto Rico, is also unbelievably linked to New York City system, Proximo. And so what I'm trying to look at is that <clears throat> each move, each wave, each group that was coming in differ greatly. Anytime you study groups that migrate, you have to look at two things or three things. First, who migrated? Second, what was happening in the place you were migrating to? Okay, and why the relationship takes place. In the case of Puerto Rican migration, we have changed from the revolutionaries to the working class, back and forth, in and out. Also, where? So if we come in the 1850s and 1890s, we, our early pioneers were tobacco workers, dog workers, and political exiles, and all kinds of people, and they themselves were much involved in the political life and the cultural life of New York City, as any other immigrant group, limited by that, okay? And so, what I've, uh, so with the, <coughs> the corporate be period, uh, <coughs> which is the very early period, we had this long-term relationship with sugar and all that, so, Naturally, the sons and daughters of the merchants also migrated because they came to do all kinds of things, including look for adventure. And, and most importantly, people keep forgetting that we were here in the 1920s because our people went to World War I and many stayed in New York when they came back. Our veterans were also part of the story in the 1920s. And so, and again, one of the reasons people don't know much about it because we have always sort of studied history as compartmentalized stories, and we're there someplace in the major history just that we have to find ourselves because nobody's gonna do it for us. And so what I'm looking here is that we all know, we've heard of Jesus Colón, Bernardo Vega, which are key people uh, in the development of not only the in certain industry, in this case tobacco, but also the more intelligence, intelligentsia, whatever you want to call it, skilled labor force of the late 19th century, early 20th century. We were there with the Cubans, not only the Cubans. So, so one of the things I'm trying, if you were to rewrite New York City's history, which I hope one day they do, you have to look at how that built environment reflects not only the immigrants from Europe, but immigrants from the Caribbean, the oldest, uh, Spanish church, which is over in Washington Heights. I mean, there's, there's a lot of missed opportunities to locate us in the in US, particularly in New York City's history. I'll be fast. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Proximo. Uh, okay. One of the things which I was trying to do is that the industrial waste took us in two different directions. 
like I said, the first group came and, 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 and very much told in the, in the early industries. But the second group had an unfortunate situation. Uh, given the US Puerto Rico relationship, metropolis called colony, we had this uneven power relationship. So what happens is in the 1940s, especially, when the US went to war, the sugar industry in Puerto Rico collapsed. And the story goes that we moved here and all that stuff. But one of the things we keep forgetting is that <clears throat> we came to replace a working class which was given the opportunity to move to the burbs. We came to replace white people who had the opportunity to move to the levee towns and the other places. And people think that it's magic that you have the white burbs and the black cities. Well, it's not magic, it's called segregation. And unless we link ourselves to that story, we begin to fantasize about Puerto Ricans. And in fact, we ended up and then, you know, in enclaves, and there are two kinds of enclaves, the people who want to be with people that look like them, and people who are forced to live with people that look like them. One is a ghetto, the other one is a slum. But anyhow, and when the two mix, we end up in the Lower East Side. So what I'm trying to suggest is, uh, is that <clears throat> when I started doing a little quick research for this, and I said, what about the 1890s, and I found one of the most interesting references, which is, uh, which is the work by Jacob Rees, 1890, How the Other Half Lives. And it's important because it's basically photography. And when I started looking at the titles, Jew Town, Irish Town, all these gen very, very, what you would call today very negative stereotypes, and he was actually a progressive talking about these poor people, but in fact, he begins to suggest that as early in industrial New York, that people were told where to live. Very clearly. This is not, I want to go to this. No, no, you end up in Jewtown because you're a Jew. Irish town because you're an Irish. Chinatown because you're a Chinese, and that's the end of it. So it's not this romantic thing about place and identity, which I work on. <laughs> There's nothing romantic. People end up fighting the system to be able to recognize that they exist. So the Chinatowns, as we all know, now, um, some of you don't know, Chinatown, is, is especially the California Chinatown, was their force. They, they, in fact, the first zoning law in, in San Francisco outlawed Chinese laundries. The very first law to outlaw Chinese laundries. They thought that they could read the get rid of all Chinese by zoning them out of existence. So when you look at the American story, you have to look at as each city begins to grow and develop. We were there, and we were going, anyhow. The Lower East Side story is important, and part of it because, if anything, the Lower East Side is what I call the cemetery of good intentions. <laughs> first houses, how many of you know that that is the very first housing, public housing project in the US? Actually, the second one was in Puerto Rico, the Paran Stereo. Nothing that is that. Okay? Interestingly, first housing was actually a very good experiment which people seem to have forgotten. After first houses, what you have is in my profession, I'm an architect and a planter, uh, we decided that, especially planning, a, a mode of thinking of the built environment in a very determinist view. If you erase the slum, people will magically become nice and all that. They'll get jobs magically and all that. So slum clearance is also called urban renewal after first houses becomes the mode as the city began to shift from industrial to post-industrial. The 1950s and 60s, as we know, saw the massive, massive restructuring of the American city. New York City peaked in jobs and people in 1960. Between 1960 and 1990, New York City lost one million plus people. And guess who was around and who was in this place? Black and Puerto Ricans. If you look at the map of New York City between 1950 and 1980, you will find that every major urban renewal project was displacing either a black or a Latino population. The Lower East Side is important because the reason Lower East Side exists is that there was a group in the 1960s and early 70s called Coalition for Human Housing. And Coalition for Human Housing in 1969 went and in, squatted into Masaryk Tower in the Lower East Side 
and they stay there for a week until they got a promise from the city of New York that they will get something. The group that was organizing that was called the Coalition for Human Housing. And the reason I mentioned that is that in 1994, whatever it was, Janet Abuli got, is she here? No. Wrote this wonderful book about the Lower East Side, and on page whatever it is, she has a footnote. And the footnote says the following. We know that the story of the Puerto Rican, uh, the housing struggle in the Lower East Side is founded on the Puerto Rican struggle. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a qualified scholar to write about it, and so you won't find it in this book. And the whole book is about the housing struggle. And there's a footnote that mentions us. I'm not joking. This is a scholar from the new school. So what I'm trying to suggest is that when you look at celebrating Loisaida. Loisaida ends up being the product of a struggle we start in the lower, lower east side, trying to get control of Sewer Park, urban renewal, and then from Sewer Park, after that uh, uh, squatter thing that Ernesto and his crowd did, the city gave them two projects, Campos Plaza and Mariana Brasetti houses. But we did not stop there, and we started saying we need to plan ahead. And a group of people from the coalition began getting of Pueblo Nuevo, which some of you here may know something about, because all the way back. Then, when I was very young then, we started working on with the NYU workshop and planning, and we call what you call today Polisaida, Barrio Nuevo. We actually began to use the word Barrio Nuevo in all of our plans. It didn't happen, but my de the idea was that the only way we were going to get to be able to imprint our identity, impregnate the environment with our identity was to take control of that environment. So it's really Loisaida to the degree that uh, <clears throat> It's a product of a long struggle. It did not happen by magic. It did not happen because somebody wrote a poem. Trust me. <laughs> Bimbo Rivas, that crowd, that night, we all got drunk and high, you name it. And we were having great fun. And the idea was, how do we convince people to, to eliminate Lower East Side? Because we hated Alphabet City, all those other names. And that's why it was fun. So that's all my intervention. Good night. <laughs> It's too long, so I'm going to go as fast as I can. Uh, yeah, um, okay, um, this text is called Models and Subjects, but it's really not, it's a teaser for a bigger text that I couldn't write. My thanks to Yasmin and Libertad for inviting me to speak here. It has been a real struggle to get it together. Unlike most of my texts, this one just gets bigger and bigger, so really today I will only give you a, a bit of it, a teaser. Uh, I never lived in Loisaida. I worked there for a time as a storefront proprietor and as a production employee. So while I later gravitated back to the land of the eggheads, I never took my degree in hangoutology. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, two more. Okay, good. 1974, I moved to New York. I lived for a year in a closet in Soho, my horizons defined by my internship for Art Forum magazine. I was learning to be a critic, a line guard of quality and artistic integrity, even though to be sure I knew nothing about either. I met a lot of fascinating people from many countries, but finally being a critic turned out to be a job I could not do. While living there, I fell in with the artists who were starting the artist organization called CoLab. They were my peer group. This organization began to cohere in 1977. I knew there were Puerto Ricans in New York. I'd grown up in Los Angeles, which is very largely Mexican. My mother, a sociologist, studied them as an ethnic group. The artists of CoLab were diverse, but nearly all were white, Anglo or Jewish. But they did differ, different things. The diversity of the group was stylistic. One of the first projects that got underway was a cable TV show shot in part on Super 8 film called All Color News. Scott and Beth B. produced a segment on the Francis Tavern bombing by the FALN. 
They visited the police, re-photographed some grisly morgue pictures, and interviewed the chief of the arson and explosion squad. In later films, the bees continued to work with this material, but what they did had nothing to do with the FLN. They were interested in the psychopathology of repression, not the dreams and nightmares of liberation movements. The bees' work was part of a general fascination among collab artists with terrorism, that's in quotes, the revolutionary violence of the RAF, the Red Brigades, and the FALN, all lumped up into a violent political movement with an inherent glamour of opposing the state. These were militant underdogs which we tried to understand, or at least to depict. Uh, I produced a journal called the Terrorist News Annual, although, though that was more a performance than a publication. Of these groups, somehow the foreigners were more safe. By instinct, we knew to avoid any close engagement with the FALN. Indeed, this interest was playing with politics, playing with politics. Diego Cortez, not the real name of this Chicago artist, called it esoterrorism. The widespread revolutionary activism we found so stirring involved living lives beyond limits which most of us would never even approach. These movements cried out for recognition, for remembrance and acknowledgement of the avalanche of media blackout, criminalization, exile, imprisonments, and judicial killings. What they stood for, why they did it, never seemed to be a fit subject for discussion, nor did we very much help to open that discussion. Semiotex published their autonomia issue about the Italian radical movement, but I did not study it. Only recently did I learn of the fierce state repression and exiles of that movement in 1977. Collab started a series of theme shows in different members' artist studios. A group anchored by me and my friends assayed a dramatic experiment in this vein and tried on the subject of real estate. To make it special, we occupied a vacant city-owned building for the show. That's the one. Sorry. If Go back. One, two, three, four. What? Back, 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 back. Um, yes, that's it. Very nice. Um, perfect. This is a perfect building, a very public showroom at 123 Delancey Street, right above the subway stop. It's a vacant lot now. Plate glass windows all around on the approach to the Williamsburg Bridge was the kind of very public space unofficial artists don't get anymore in global cities. After one delirious day, we were shut down. At the street side press conference the next day, the famous German artist, Joseph Beuys, showed up with his entourage in the press. Uh, next, please. Uh, we were covered in... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. You can go to the next one, too. We were covered in the New York Times. There's Beuys up there. Uh, then, much to our surprise, we got a relocation. As a veteran of the Italian social center movement later told me, oh, they gave you an Asaneo to a tiny little storefront right beside the bridge, which became our field office. This was around the corner from Clinton Street, a bustling and solidly Spanish shopping street of small, interesting stores. There we collected ourselves, recovered from the shock of success, then goofed around for a while running performances. One night, a handsome, voluble guy named Felix Perez and his friend with Coke bottle glasses and an albino pit bull came to our door. Felix offered to protect us. He was a very personable fellow, and we worked well with him. Later, he ran the bar at our evening events with a speed rack of liquor set up so it could be whisked out of sight if police came along to investigate our events. They never did, which in itself was significant. We were doubtless being used to better the neighborhood, although we weren't really thinking that way at the time. Over, over time, we learned more of Felix's story. He was a Vietnam vet and said he'd packed body bags with heroin over there. He liked hanging out with us and even acted in a couple of the cable TV shows we did, preparing the props at our space. But Felix wasn't an artist. Uh, next, please. Um, soon we moved from Delancey Street. The city offered us a vacant storefront on Rivington Street. It had been a beauty salon, but now water poured in regularly from the ceiling. When we got the keys, we saw that the former proprietors had pulled up a display case and burned incense upon it like an altar. They had conducted a full-dress, leave-taking ceremonial for the business they were giving up. The basement storefront was also soon abandoned. It was Vidio's upholstery shop. I think I saw the guy once. So we, we kind of slithered down there. A live phone was still hooked up, a party line, which worked for a week or so, and some artworks had been left behind, a modernist cityscape in a 1920s Cubist style, and a picture of two gangsters, Natalie dressed and signing to each other. 
with jackets marked jesters and Latin kings. Someone found a handmade drum decorated with metal strips on the street and brought it in. All this scenery left behind bespoke an ubiquitous, albeit mysterious, Latin presence. Next, please. 156 Rivington was a place where clearly ceremonies had taken place. Networks had been developed and where two aesthetic enterprises had preceded us, a beauty parlor and an upholstery shop, both undone by floods of water and the press of the growing drug trade. Since we had never really planned on being there, and our being there had come with an almost foolish ease, we regarded all this with fascination and deep respect. The milieu of ABC became a material for our work. Observing the faded sign of another defunct business across the street, we named the place after the remains of that sign, Abogado Notario. We came to call the place No Rio. Today it is called ABC, which is a real linguistic difference. As we began then, we mediated through artifacts, through what academics call material culture. Next, please. The storefront next to our namesake was a derelict formal wear store. It burned one night, and the next day we looted the heaps of scorched tuxedos, painting tropical motifs on the lapels of a bunch of the cleaner white ones. Our band was called the Cardboard Air Band, and we played the Mud Club. Next, please. Tom Warren discovered a mother load of neighborhood relics while he was nosing around the shattered archives of the photography studio in the abandoned building next door. The owners of Gus's photo studio had in fact built 156 Rivington, where we were, as an adjunct building, but finally they abandoned both of them. The photos Tom found at many stages of retouching inspired him to open his own portrait studio exhibition at ABC No Rio. This project was the most directly successful attempt to engage the neighborhood, as people sort of naturally drifted back in for cheap Polaroid pictures. Elona Granite's artfully painted window sign, Venga Ahora, made, remained up for the season. Our experience of Puerto Rican culture was very much of the street, just as our address, I mean our pitch, our way of working, started, starting with the heavily trafficked corner of Delancey Street where we'd opened the real estate show, was to the street. Uh, next, please. For us, this new Lower East Side was the street. We took what we saw as our metier, as the reality to be dealt with. It was sort of like looking at documentary photography. I recall at the time being entranced by Helen Levitt's photos of the old Lower East Side. Some of our best friends in the neighborhood during this time were children, successors to those poor kids, making something out of nothing who had charmed Helen Levitt. While we were very sensitive to our position in the Latin neighborhood, and to a great extent our collective decisions were determined by our sense of it, we were working in the dark. Still, just like any other shopkeeper, we had something to sell. Next, please. Uh, Felix Perez wasn't the only adult of the community to come into ABC. Felipe, the wacky, cane-waving uncle of the Dominican kids upstairs who only came in stinking drunk, became a problem we would have to warn people about. He's there tormenting Samoa on stage. He was relatively harmless, but he was big. We had regular visits from Ada, an elderly Jewish woman, vending schmatas from a shopping cart full of old clothing. She spoke loudly a wild brew of English, Yiddish, and Spanish. Later, Jorge Brandon, El Coco Que Habla, also dropped by with his shopping cart full of sign painting equipment. Next, please. Jorge was an artist, but he was incomprehensible to us, a total character. <laughs> He's a, even now, as I have studied some Spanish, when I hear him on tape, I cannot make out 10% of his discourse. <laughs> it took Josh Gojiak to hook us up with Puerto Rican literati. Uh, next, please. Josh was the editor with Maurice Kenny of Contact Two, a literary magazine dedicated to the resurgent multicultural literary movement. Kenny was a Mohawk poet from Akwesasne, an Indian like the magnetic Lois Sidera, Diane Burns. Josh arranged for important New Yorkian poets to read at ABC as part of our poetry, video, and music series. Jorge Brandon came back in the series Josh organized with his friends from Chavez as the great, haggard, and shabbily dressed orator drawn on. Our audience began to tire of the sonorously beautiful but regrettably unintelligible performance. <laughs> Bimbo Rivas told us there was only one way to get the old man off the stage. Give me five dollars, he said, <laughs> then slipped out the door. Bimbo soon returned with an order of fried chicken, pieces of which he ostentatiously waved under Jorge's nose. Pollo frito, it's the only way to get the performer off stage. <laughs> Next, please. Although, although we did not understand him, we loved the talking coconut. 
Robert Goldman, a.k.a. Bobby G., lived in our basement after he left his loft in Brooklyn and began a series of paintings of people in the neighborhood. He traced the outlines of his paintings of local youth in an electrifying lattice of silver paint. This painting of Jorge and his hat out front of ABC is one of my favorite works of his. Uh, next, please. Josh was a book, oh, this is Jorge, uh, on the cover of Seth Tobachman's book, uh, War in the Neighborhood, about the squatter movement. This is an end of his life, uh, Jorge lived in the squats. Uh, next, please. Josh was a books editor. Oh, and this is Bill Lloyd on our event at the kitchen, uh, reading. Uh, next, please. Okay, Josh was books editor for the East Village Eye, a monthly news magazine that had just started in 1979. Yasmin Ramirez later wrote art criticism for the paper. The editor was Leonard Abrams, a great name in publishing, with which he had, of course, no connection. The Eye closely supported Colab and ABC No Rio, Fashion Moda, and the emerging hip-hop culture as it began to cross over. The magazine started out in a ground floor apartment on Avenue B. There, the publisher became rather too friendly with the local drug dealers, so it was a great improvement when the Eye moved to Charas. There were some great people there. Chino Garcia, Emily Rubin, Doris Cornish, when we moved in, I had a, you know, yeah, I'm going to leave that out, but I wanted very much to say a couple of things. Uh, anyway, yeah, I could go on a lot, but uh, I'm going to stop there and say first about the texture and aesthesis of interculturality during this very important moment when the USA's first ever major money-making black fine art star was rising into the heavens and the cultural landscape was changing. For the ABC book we edited, Tim Rollins of Group Materials submitted a transcript of talks he'd had with a neighbor on 13th Street. Tim transcribed only Richard's part of the talk, an extended rap, very conversational, but gently probing as to the reasons for the artist's presence on the block. In the course of the talk, Richard, no last name, raises some questions, some possibilities for what a community-based art space could do. We know each other, Richard says to Tim Rollins, and we get along and talk a lot together, but you've got to admit that we're both straining to relate. Like, you can't even speak Spanish. We're not enemies, but we do have different histories. Our people, the indigenous population, so to speak, see you new people all busting your ass, cleaning up the space, putting on shows, doing workshops for kids, but we still don't know why you're doing it, and why here? Like, you don't even know us. There's something unreal about it, right? Right. Next, please. Group Material opened their storefront on East 13th Street in 1980 with many of the same intentions that we, as we at ABC. The show they made of personally precious artifacts gathered from their neighbors, called Arroz con Mango, set the pattern for the eclectic curatorial projects the group did. These carried Group Material to global fame as an artist collective. Over 20 years later, Tim Rollins recalled the show they call, that they called The People's Choice, Arroz con Mango. Quote, we asked everybody on the block to bring in an object that had special value to them. That's when I realized, this is how you do it. This is what democracy might look like. It was full of fantasy and surprise and joy and humor and wit, all the things so often lacking in, quote, political art. Well, there's a lot more to say on that. Suffice, suffice it to say that the lessons learned from Puerto Rican culture and Loi Saida helped a lot of gringo artists get famous. The, the last thing I wanted to say concerns the phenomenon of the kind of place we are in today, which I first entered for Brian Pearsall's stage painting show called Salsa and Colors. Then this place was called Solidaridad Humana, and it, like ABC No Rio, existed in an uneasy relationship to the state. The real estate show was a symbolic occupation, a tactic developed first in the civil rights, then in the student struggles of the 1960s. That it led to an Ateneo to 156 Rivington Street was almost an accident. But the building occupations undertaken by Puerto Rican groups during the 1970s have a direct parallel with those being done in Europe, beginning in the 1970s in Italy. I have recently been studying the phenomenon of the occupied social centers. It is strong in Spain, in Barcelona, and Madrid, where they are called Centros Sociales Ocupados. This movement seeks to take over large, vacant city buildings for political, social, and cultural purposes. It is closely tied to the glo global justice movements, and it is anti-neoliberal, anti pro-immigrant, and for obvious reasons completely blacked out of all but the underground media. Yes, Virginia, there is still an underground. I began studying the New York City squatting movement closely with Clayton Patterson early in this century, although we began to work together on this in 1994. 
And now I am confident to say that the large-scale occupied building managed in order to provide political and cultural provision is a mode of autonomous, extra-state, disobedient political organization pioneered by Puerto Ricans in New York City in the 1970s. The insurrectionary urban development that we alluded to in the manifesto of the real estate show in 1979 was in fact being carried out for Puerto Ricans, by Puerto Ricans. Thank you very much. Well, it was, uh, that was great. Um, I, I did get a PhD in hangoutology. And uh, one of the places I hung out from time to time was ABC Novia. Thank you, uh, Yasmin and Libertad, for inviting me to speak. Um, the note I got was to talk about the connection between the documentary that um, I co-directed with Laura Rivera, who is here. <coughs> about um, <clears throat> gentrification of uh, Spanish Harlem, of Bahu. Um, but I found it like it was too much fun for me to write like about what I, I wrote. I'm not going to do anything visual. You can just imagine in your head what I'm going to read. Um, so I, I thought I would, I, I'm writing here, I'm going to read this uh, brief gentrification memoir, which is got eight, seven points, and then I'll finish with a, a rehash of some of my old poetry. Um, many artists of the Lower Cytosine were motivated by anti-gentrification activism, but the process is, ironic, is ironically aided by the presence of the same artists. It was ironically aided by the presence of the same artists. They made alliances with the Puerto Rican neighborhood, as we had discovered earlier, the famous appearances of William Burroughs and Allen Ginsberg at the original New Rican Poets Cafe, for instance, was uh, a herald of this. Later, poet Bob Holman and Pedro Pietri staged readings in theater at several neighborhood spots like the Life Cafe, Chavez, ABC No Rio. There were even several names of art galleries in the neighborhood that had Spanish sounding names like Nolo Condere, which, Nolo Contendere, which is actually a Latin legal term. No Say No, the Aztec Club, etc. There was also a kind of darker flip side to these uh, new anthros of uh, Loisaida clubs, uh, like a club that opened up on House and Sea called the Sin Club, an acronym that stood for safety in numbers. The, uh, the flyer that advertised the Sin Club um, recommended that you approach from uh, the subway on the, on the F train. And it was an allusion to um, how dangerous the neighborhood was perceived to be. Um, and, you know, actually, some of the stuff that will go run through this little selection of uh, gentrification memoir um, alludes to that, that, that kind of uh, tension between uh, the fact that it was actually a dangerous neighborhood, but then it was also the people that lived there were associated with that danger, even though they were actually just average people who were living a, a working class life. Um, as in the case in any community, there are tensions, cooperations, alliance, alliances, and disappointments. There is great irony that many of the artists who arrived in the neighborhood had a worldview that was respectful and celebratory of Puerto Ricans and other people of color in the neighborhood. In fact, one can view the story of the East Village in the 80s as a test case for the good and bad of gentrification. In some ways, gentrification has been promulgated as an antidote to the intense segregation that exists in New York. If gentrification can be viewed as a socio-political urban phenomenon that takes place in stages, then 1979 to 1987 can be viewed as a prolonged stage one, where the leading edge of gentrification were artists and activists whose mere presence made the neighborhood more palatable to more adventurous, middle-class professionals who were looking for cheap rents, an interesting nightlife, and a mixed-race living experience. <laughs> the progression, as I saw it, was clear. Openly leftist, anti-establishment artists and activists staged art shows that exposed political issues, engaged urban graffiti artists and poets. Anarchists squatted and played anti-establishment anti hardcore punk. 
Mixed race clubs like Mud Club, ABC, Brownies, and Save the Robots flourished. A gathering of the tribes was born on 2nd Street. Ultimately, however, more art galleries arrived, featuring almost exclusively white artists. Parkour clubs become hipster dives. In many glowing remembrances of the East Village heyday, the pyramid on Avenue A is cited as a classic neighborhood performance art hotspot. And it was a gender-bending breakthrough for the neighborhood, but almost no one seemed to remember that the pyramid was earlier the home of the New Rican Village, one of the most important clubs of the 70s for the New York Latino music scene. Practically the birthplace of Latin jazz, as well as the home of alternative theater promoted by and created by the late Eddie Figueroa. The bar on 7th Street and Avenue B, once a strangely beautiful shared space between old Ukrainians and Puerto Ricans with both polka and salsa on the jukebox, became one of the linchpins of Avenue B's hipsterization. My own participation in this process was peripheral. I worked for a nonprofit that provided GE training and part-time jobs for high school dropouts on 4th Street. <clears throat> my students were legendary because one day they were commandeered without my knowledge by Andy Warhol to do a photo shoot in the lunch yard for Penthouse Magazine called Macho. Warhol appeared with makeup that faked facial bruises surrounded by smiling Puerto Rican teenagers. I watched as young Latinas grew up, got pregnant, addicted to heroin. My apartment was burglarized twice. I read poetry at the Life Cafe under the name Carlos Palabra. I waited for the New York, for the New York Poets Cafe to reopen. When Operation Pressure Point came in 1984, the East Village I ran a cover story about what they called spatial deconcentration. It was a theory about gentrification that originated with a housing activist in Philadelphia who was mysteriously murdered. The theory stated that there was a plan to depopulate the inner city so suburbanites could move in. The police and helicopters that began to swarm around the neighborhood seemed to confirm this. When a scandal broke that revealed the police in the 9th Precinct were taking bribes from after-hours club owners, the wild and crazy days of Lower Side seemed about to end. I think stage two began one night when I went to a place called Neither Nor. It was interesting that Neither Nor uh, was called that because that's how I was, uh, many people were feeling about what the Puerto Rican identity was about, neither black nor white. Darius James introduced me to Miguel Pinero. His face was swollen and yellow. He didn't seem to know where he was, but yet he shook my hand, recognizing my New Yorkan face, and disappeared into a haze of Jamil Mundak's Just Grew Orchestra. Pinero died soon afterwards, setting up a famous meeting between Holman and New Yorkan cafe owner Miguel Algarin about reopening the cafe, which had been closed for years for, for renovations. About a year later, the Tompkins Square riot a, la a kind of last gasp by the anarchists and activists already enraged by the renovated Cristadora building on Avenue B signaled the second straight stage of gentrification. This is about the time I began reading poetry at the newly reopened New York and Poets Cafe. The New York and Poets Cafe was originally a space created by and for New York and Poets as the volume released in 1976, which featured, among others, Algarín, Piñero, Sandra Maria, Sandra Maria Esteves, and Lucky Cienfuegos pretty much captured that scene. The new cafe had bigger ambitions, which took place, uh, which, which uh, crystallized on a Friday night uh, slam hosted by uh, Bob Holman. The slam, imported from Chicago, transformed the cafe from a place where neighborhood or barrio specific bilingual literary movement was nurtured into a freewheeling experimental space for 90s multiculturalism. It was a wonderful place to meet people, read your poetry, and feel safe to express political sentiments that opposed the first Gulf War, for instance, during the waning years of Bush I. But the slam was a classic postmodern device where poetry often moved away from form and substance and toward an overindulgence, I'm, see, I'm sorry, from content and substance and toward an overindulgence in form. The most positive thing I can say about the slam is that it, op it offered a platform for hip hop poetry, a space where, where that form of the four elements of hip hop could flourish, even as gangster rap began to eat away at hip hop's idealism. 
But until a new wave of young New Yorkans emerged in the mid-90s, it meant the erasing of Puerto Rican from the New Yorkan Poets Cafe. It also played a significant role in the gentrification of the neighborhood. While many of the original artists from the East Village days had fled across the Williamsburg Bridge to yet another seminal Puerto Rican neighborhood, a new set of multicultural hipsters stretched in long lines down Third Street, waiting to see what they had seen on MTV's first season of Real World, which starred emerging cafe poet Kevin Powell. Things would never be the same. It was time for stage three. Many years later, I became interested in Spanish Harlem because a new gentrification story was taking place, this time without the trappings of the avant-garde art world. It was a slow process because unlike the Lower East Side, Spanish Harlem is dotted with the largest concentration of housing projects of any neighborhood in Manhattan. Uptown, I found a purer version of New York and Puerto Rican culture, one that had in the past had friction with the excesses of those already downtown New Yorkans. Its cultural spaces have steered away from alliances with Bohemia and focused on Puerto Rican heroes, food, dance, and attitude. It remains to be seen what this form of resegregation will result in for New Yorkan culture in New York. But it's important that names like Jorge Brandon, Bimbo Rivas, Sandra Maria Esteves, Ed Vega, Rosalba Rodon, Juan Sanchez, Clemente Soto Velez, just to name a few, are canonized, canonized in the cultural history of this city, our Nova York. And now I'll read this poem. I survived those days of sweet snowfall on 6th Street, when negocio was everywhere, that's business as usual, when glazed-eyed runners appeared to feed the line with dimes, and the lookouts gave the call like pregoneros de la calle, dato bien, dato bien, the coast is clear, it's all good. And there were nights when I'd come home and find everything on the floor, clocks stopped, plugs pulled out, and I checked the windows and the locks. And I could tell that they came in through the fire escape, into the kitchen, past the cat, the cat assuming they were old friends. And I didn't call the police, and I realized it would take days to recover. And I nailed the windows shut, and I thought about getting a dog. The girl next door is stuffing paper in the front door lock and the overnight banging trying to get in with enough pockmarks in her face to look for dates on 12th Street, dates with packets of C and D. Liberty, liberty, liberty. She was once so beautiful and no one deserved to die like that. Still someone, still somehow, through the blessed bilingual and the spray-painted artifactual, the spirit survived, and it wasn't such a mongo affair after all. Dato bien, the coast is clear, it's all good. It's what Pedro taught me, planting poems in phone booths to spread the word about healing. Our low east side of selves. When the crack dens closed down, we were still singing on Avenue C and D. Low east side, named after the river that flowed to my father's birthplace. Low east side, the rhyming of Pinero's stabbing and shooting, transformed into imaginary homeland, a post-nation without borders, where my soul will last forever. Dato bien, the coast is clear, it's all good. And it's like, going through my work for tonight's discussion, I was looking at work that kind of like addresses my particular response to being Puerto Rican in the Lower East Side, which is, my response to being a poet who listens. As simple as that. It was not about race, it was not about culture, it was not about any of that. It was just like embodying a human being and absorbing their world. So in that way, my poetry was not necessarily about the Boricua experience. However, in hindsight, that could be taken in another interpretation. So I'm going to read one poem first and then the panelists will discuss and then I'll close. And the pieces I selected are, I guess, the Lower East Side's influence on my work and how that manifests itself as a Puerto Rican poet and like that. 
So this is called, I'm trying to perfect my accent. I'd like to sliver America, live in a separate America, one that is more of a America, the one that I don't, that's America. Entering the USA, leaving La Isla behind, leaving the Atlantic behind, the Atlantic Lito, if you will. Limping to America's horizon, all these ways are ways of same. America waiting for us, open arms jowled with expectation and furry eyebrows, dismantling our strip mall hairdos. Have a senor nigga, the negro will get too, but not me. Bienvenudo to the bicoastal lengua. Fort Tongue Mandela speech so true splits the tongue into bi-coastal lesions as America tries hard to perfect her accent. Her accent. Oh yes, Sombra, when did my otter become your otter? Tongue Gaiva, Lady Saliva, mounted in Biber, riding the ride of a no one ride with me cause I'm with me and I ain't no one. See, we all want a piece of that lingua. Syllables caught on her ear, screaming Ecolia for the Baba Patria. Melt down your moetrics, Mama Manta. Lipicizing on her back legs, America rears up and proudly mounts. Rapunzel's locks, Casas Blancas, Ivory Torres, Ebonic Flores, Edwin Torres, open your borders and call me you. I'm another Taino, Richando Porro, tu. Oh, lonely widow of varicostal impunity, safe against your bargain culture, illegally alien by the color of grass. How ironic, to gain freedom, you must acquire a card, the color of nature. Oh, America, oh, America, oh, see of rich chica, caca, oh, musica, oh, musica, oh, malava, palava, musica, oh, cucumbia, humbombia, afisompica, clum, clum, miha, oh, mamarica, oh, paparica, oh, hu, hu. Oh, I want to mix up America. Live in the other America. Maybe discover America. Because I'm alone, I'm America. <laughs> I want to thank Kasmin and um, Libertad El Centro, Clemente Soto Vélez, uh, for offering us this opportunity. Um, I will read like my last uh, comrades did because uh, I'm not a big orator, but um, I did gather my thoughts. My name is Maria Dominguez, and I wrote Bomba, Bomba. Este barrio quiere bomba. I was asked to present um, one of my murals of, of several in the Lower East Side, which is called Baile Bomba. Maria Dominguez, in particular, is one of the most accomplished and exhibited artists in, in the Puerto Rican community. She has been active. She has been an active muralist in the Lower East Side area. She has conducted several Chara-sponsored workshops with kids and local artists and has worked in such noteworthy murals as Baile Bomba in 1983 on Clinton Street, Homenaje a Don Pedro in Campos Plaza, La Lucha Continua in La Plaza Cultural, and, um, and they all are celebrating vibrant Caribbean heritage. This is a quote from Gateway to the Promised Land, Ethnic Cultures in the Lower East Side by Mario Mafi. By the 1980s, as Reagan's trickle-down economics was being introduced into our nation, the political mural movement that began in New York City with city walls and city arts during the 60s and the 70s had decreased. In the Lower East Side in particular, amidst the abandoned buildings, rubbles and drugs, a vibrant surge from the arts cultural movement was occurring, the legendary New Yorkian poets. Plays and poetry were acted and recited in corners of Loisaida. Bomba dance troupes such as 
Bori uh, Baile Boricua during, were dancing literally in the streets under the auspice of the local group, Charas. Mural making projects were minimal, but still a strong presence. These factors other, and others became part of an important historical time for the Puerto Rican experience in New York City. In 1982, while attending the School of Visual Arts, the City Arts Workshop, a mural making organization in the area, awarded me an internship. During that summer, I was fortunate enough to work under the leadership of Joe Stevenson, a muralist, who created Avenue C, Fox storefronts between 4th and 6th Street in Lois Island. The City Arts Workshops was sponsored by the New York Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs Administration, was undergoing transition at the time. This organization was founded by Susan Shapiro Kiok in 1968. Its mission at the time was to fund community artists, local residents, and other participants who create public artworks, mainly murals. Little or no artistic background was needed, just a desire to create political statements through public arts. By 1983, funding, the funding, pardon, by 1983, funding organizations in general and arts organizations specific in our nation felt the effects of the president's adoptions of his neoliberal economic policies. Funding for the City Arts Workshop was affected. The New York State Council of the Arts and other private agencies in an effort to avoid conflict requested for more open process. Instead of the organization-driven artists, the administration, uh, they wanted somebody who had more administrative um, know-how and, and who knew how to fundraise. During the same time, Pueblo Nuevo were actively looking for a commission. We're going too fast with the slides. <laughs> I was just setting a format. Go back, please. During the same time, Pueblo Nuevo was actively looking for a commission to commission a mural, preferably a Latino or a Latina artist. The housing organization founded by Hispanic immigrants in the 1970s dedicated itself to rebuilding decayed community and renovating and, and prevention of displacement of families. Pueblo Nuevo the and the sponsorships under the sponsorships of the New York City Economic Development and a federally funded grant for the commercial revitalization project, the Clinton Street Business uh, Improvement District wanted the mural for beautification. And as you see right here, uh, this, is, this, this is what the street looked like at the time. They wanted the mural to appeal, appeal to developers and ultimately assist in the revitalization of the area. Pueblo Nuevo targeted these two walls. So I guess we saw the first one and this is the second wall. It was on the main thoroughfare, Clinton Street, and East House, between East House and Stanton. They approached City Arts with their request and they put an open call. Confident of my uh, abilities by then, I was an intern the year before, confident of my abilities then, I responded and submitted a design. It was selected over 15 other artists. Thus while still a junior in SVA, School of Visual Arts, my role as a professional muralist emerged. My design was a representational image of a female bomba dancer in red garb. The dance derived from Africa and other Caribbean culture is said to be the dance of cleansing, the dance of renewal, an image and dance form of local Puerto Ricans and Caribbean members in the community would recognize. While we, while we were all in fear of the constant growth and threat of gentrification, it was also a way for us not to be eradicated from its wrath. So, bomba, bomba, coño, we still hear bomba, was my intent with the design. Okay. Although the community had selected the design, they recognized it and had, had uh, accepted it and voted for it, OED said, we're not going to approve this. They said, no, <laughs> we want Fox storefront just like the Avenue C mural. 
community leaders got together and said, this is censorship. So Nestor Cortijo, at the time, who was the chair of um, uh, Pueblo Nuevo, Chino Garcia, uh, director of Charas, Kathy Gupta, City Arts, and the bid, the um, Clinton Street Business uh, District people got together and said, we're going to stage a walk-in. And they sure did. We all got together along with other local members and we walked into the OED offices and said, we want a clear explanation for the censorship. We don't want storefronts. We want Bailomba. In less than 30 minutes, the meeting was over. The mural would go up as planned. Okay, slides. <coughs> On July 1983, joined by five students of the Summer Youth Employment Program, one assistant, and community members of the community began the project. Six weeks later, in late September, it was completed. Go ahead. By October 1st, 1983, Clinton Street was closed. Go ahead. And the celebration began. It was documented by photographer, by noted photographer and community resident Marlise Momber, if the, if the images come up. Anyway, the watch, okay, Marlise documented it, and at the same time, a very small um, uh, newspaper, Washington Market Review, also presented it. Okay, so Deborah Mutnick, who was at the time a reporter for this paper, said, over 75 people turned out, despite gray skies, for the October 1st dedication of one of Lori Silas' newest mural, entitled Baile Bomba. The mural expresses the spirit of the Puerto Rican dance of renewal, which is named after. It covers 600 feet of wall space and abandoned property on Clinton Street between Houston and Stanton. Along with Baile Bomba, dancers, musicians, and poet, Congressman Bill Green and City Councilwoman Miriam Freelander paid tribute to the mural. It symbolizes the rebuilding of the Lower East Side, said Green. He also commented that the projects have, that had begun to recapture the Lower East Sides from the drug trade. Can we see the black and white? Are there any black and white shots here? Okay, this is this is the okay okay this is the finished mural, uh, and if you notice uh, from the first slide, the the vacant windows. Okay, there's, there's these holes. The mural is just so beautiful; it's just shining. But yet upstairs, there's these holes in the windows. Okay, move to the next one, please. Can you? Okay, here it is. Bravo! Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, Councilwoman Freelander, you could keep going. Councilwoman Freelander emphasizes the need for the city to subsidize equity programs or projects in which community members renovate their own housing. If there are druggies in this building, she declared, it's because the city hasn't given them money to fix them. As the community continued towards transition, keep going with the slides. Okay, this is uh, uh, Baile Boricua performing in front of the mural. And Josie, I don't know, Jos I forgot Josie's last name. She was reciting poetry. That's, 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 uh, uh, Josie? No. She's reciting. Uh, no, no, the woman reciting. That's okay, no problem. Go ahead, keep going. Keep going. This is Bimbo. He's dressed as Vejigante and, and uh, the other day, somebody mentioned the uh, Salsa Twins or something. They were performing. On this day, I got to meet most of the people that uh, had a great impact in my life. I mean, Bimbo, uh, Marlies, um, uh, Magda Echevarria, the dancers. Please keep going. Miriam Freelander, uh, as she was commenting.
Maria Dominguez at, at 16. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Congressman Green. And Bimbo Rivas, as he's trying to shake his maracas, he knocked over the drums. Look at that. <laughs> Look at my face. Look at my face. Whoa! <laughs> okay. As the community continued to its, uh, uh, excuse me, as the community continued to its transition, Baile Bomba continued to its destination. Out of my 20 year olds, it still stands as one of the most documented to this day. Upon its creation, it was sought out by muralists from other cities, young journalists, captivated by its grandeur, photographers, children's magazines, and in this case, um, well, not in this case, uh, but in 1984, it got the Governor's Award for Beautification, as well as recognized by Art in America uh, in its 1984 and 1985 Guides to Gallery, Museums, and Artists, which mentions it as one of the major public artworks in the nation in 1983. This place is by Nebomba among the other public art that were mentioned on the same article was Cristo, Surrounded Islands, Jean de Buffet in uh, Moment à Fonton, and Romeo Bearden's Baltimore Art Broad, which was in the uh, mass transit in Baltimore. The attention received by this work served to affirm my community commitment, not only as a housing advocate, but now as a community muralist as well. Only three short years later, by the, by the same lure, developers arrived as planned and restored the buildings. You could keep going. As planned and restored the buildings into livable, some affordable, and, at, and some very much high-end uh, apartments. Although by Le Bomba's murals physically disappeared, it continued to haunt our memories to this day. So here's the children's magazine. It appeared in the children's magazine cover. In 1985, after the City Arts Workshop's changes, led by Eva Cockroft, the core team artists, Willie Burt, Joe Stevenson, Leslie Bender, and Camille, Parad, and myself assisted in, assisted in co-founding Art Makers, a new mural making group. As a team, we created our first mural, Ballooning, at the Emanuel Daycare Center at 6th Street between Avenue C and D. The same year, I was invited to Campos Plaza to create a mural with their youth. Uh, and this was called Homenaje a Don Pedro. The following year, our community people on Clinton Street and La Lucha Continua, a project I created, and the name of that mural was Sueño. It included 29 artists who together joined efforts in creating a major mural making event at the corner of Avenue C and 9th Street, La Plaza Cultural, in a place called Loisaida. <laughs> By the way, by the way, um, uh, maybe a year ago, uh, most of uh, the New York City mural movement had not been documented. Uh, as of uh, early this year, uh, my friend Janet Weissman and another friend Janet Brown uh, Renitz created this wonderful book, On the Wall, Four Decades of Community Mural in New York City. And she is here, she has copies available. Please, if you're interested in the mural movement in New York City, uh, uh, please um, ask me and I will direct you to Jane. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I've uh, lived in the uh, Lower East Side since 1979 and basically started documenting it uh, from that time. I have a lot of disagreements with a lot of the uh, sort of professionals about how they see gentrification and like that. And certainly from my perspective, because of living in different parts of Lower East Side, what I saw really 
beginning with the gentrification Lower East Side was really the Chinese money crossing Canal Street. And, uh, you know, you always get, um, I guess most of the uptown guys have left, but uh, what, what happens with gentrification is you always sort of get standard sort of points of view. But from when I was living in the Bowery at that time, working for a, a landlord who owned a bunch of property, this was when Reagan came into power, and then all of a sudden all of this money started crossing Canal Street. There was a huge volume of money. And everybody wants to blame the artist. Well, the reality is the artist didn't own the property. It's who owns the property dictates the value of the land. And that property really started changing hands. People talk about the Pyramid Club here, for example. Uh, Pyramid Club at that time the, uh, purchased by the Chinese, the, the building on the end of my block. I ended up over at 161 Essex. The end of my block, which was Jasper John's studio, was bought by the Chinese. The building next to me was bought by the Chinese. Most of the, the block down from me was bought by the Chinese. And then when I came over this way, and actually proof of that is you can see people that were around at that time, you can see it went from Little Italy to Chinese. So it's easy to sort of, you know, blame the artist and point to the artist, but it's really who buys the land and who dictate. That's then the flipping started, and all of a sudden, once this huge amount of money came into came into play, what happened is is that uh, then the property started really going up in value. Once the property goes up in value, the mortgages go up, the buildings started getting flipped, and you could probably remember that period of time. So it was really this Chinese money, and it was interesting too with the Chinese because now 30 years later they own our debt. They own the manufacturing, they own